welcome everybody and thank you so much for joining me for tonight's Mary Trump show strategy session where we talk about what's at stake in the 2022 midterms and what we who actually care about democracy are going to do about it. Uh, there are two things we know. One, American democracy is in real danger. Two, in November 2022, the Democrats need to win races at every level of government and hold on to or preferably increase its razor thin margins in the House and the Senate. There's one very important thing we don't know, however, and that's partially what our strategy sessions are about. How the hell are we going to make sure that that second thing happens? Uh, joining me uh, tonight, I'm ecstatic to have with me Charlotte Clymer as a writer, transgender activist, communications consultant, and military veteran. Uh, her blog, The Excellent and often quite funny Charlotte's Web Thoughts is a must read uh, in it. She covers politics, current events, and the LGBTQ community. Uh, Renee Stubbs is also with us tonight, former world number one in doubles. She's won six Grand Slams and is currently the host of Racket Magazine's coach and is one of the best, if not the best, tennis commentators out there. We're also lucky to be joined by Lisa Turner, who served in the Obama administration as an appointee at USDA and HHS. She's worked on national political uh, scene for many years as a campaign consultant at the federal, state, and local levels. And thankfully for us, Lisa is the executive director of LPAC, the premier national committee supporting LGBTQ plus women candidates running for political office. Charlotte and Renee, along with me, are also on LPAC's board welcome it is so good to see you guys hello Great to be here. hello hello um okay um i've been spending the day trying to make up stuff to chat about with you um <laughs> just kidding <laughs> so this is this is this is the uh, state of play uh in a very uh, abbreviated form republicans are not wasting any time in less than a month They've gone from calling anybody who supports LGBTQ plus rights pedophiles and groomers. Uh, they've basically um, succeeded in overturning Roe and everything that implies. I have a feeling we'll have a thing or two to say about that. Uh, and as of today, I think I just heard this. Um, a group of Republican senators are calling for America's television rating system to warn parents about sexual orientation and gender identity content on children's TV shows because they have to sexualize everything. And all of this, of course, is against the backdrop of unremitting assaults on the rights and safety of transgender children and so many others in our community. Uh, Lisa, I want to start with you. Help? <laughs> <laughs> no, I'll, I'll, <laughs> well, you know, less vague, uh, you know, I, one of the biggest problems besides the onslaught is, uh, the lack of real information, trustworthy information. Um, can you talk a little bit about how that can really help shape voters, um, ideas about how to vote for whom to vote, et cetera? Well, thanks, Mary, and um, it's good to be with you all. And Mary, happy belated birthday! Um, Thank you. It was a great day to celebrate. Happy and birthday! <laughs> <laughs> My birthday at the end of Roe v. Wade. It was awesome. Exactly. What a day! Yeah, um, well. You know, one of the things that I've learned over my years in politics and campaigns is this, is that campaigns are won and lost at the local level. And, you know, how well a candidate can stand up for something and be authentic in the way that they defend who they are, why they're running, and not shy away from their true beliefs, that is the most important thing in protecting our democracy, but also those key people that we want to see elected to those seats that are going to do that once they get into that body. And, you know, the dissemination of information on a macro level about what we're witnessing now is very difficult. It just takes one misstep, as we saw with Harry McCullough. And 
Charlotte, I can hear everything you're eating. I'm not sure what's going on there, but I want a snack. That if you're oh, I'm sorry. I didn't know you could hear this. I'm opening this bag. I apologize. <laughs> That's okay. Just as long as you um, share. But we saw with Terry McAuliffe in Virginia in 2021, one misstep, one phrase in that debate turned the whole thing on its head for Yunkin and created that path that might not quite have been there for him to have that razor thin victory. And 2021, was a clear indication to me, if we don't get real about how we talk to people, how we run campaigns and be actually true to ourselves and standing up for the things, even the LGBTQ community, the environment, abortion rights, we have to join together now, now more than ever, forget about the infighting in our own party and for the values that we all wanna represent. And luckily for us, at LPAC, we have those LGBTQ women that are as authentic as the day is long and stand up for democracy all day long. Yeah, and one thing, uh, there, there are a couple of things I wanna to touch on there, but I'll, I'll start with the pulling together part. Charlotte, we saw a couple of weeks ago, Mallory McMorrow, a state senator in Michigan, uh, give a passionate floor speech in response to a colleague's egregiously calling her, uh, a pedophile and a groomer because she's mm -hmm. perfectly comfortable uh, supporting LGBTQ rights, trans the rights of transgender children to play sports in grade school. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I can't ready. even believe I have to say. On the playground. Uh, on the playground, mm -hmm. right? And um, the thing she stressed, in fact, twice, she identified herself as a yeah. straight, white, Christian, married, suburban mom. I think, well, let me ask you, how do we get people to understand that allyship isn't just necessary for helping uh, at-risk groups, but in the, long, in the long run, in the grand scheme of things, it helps all of us? Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, first of all, <clears throat> the package I was opening was for this lesbian pride flag I just got today. Oh, it just cool. arrived. Nice. So nice. I saw it on the desk and I was like, oh, I should show them. Um, <laughs> I yeah, think you I should wear it as a cape or something. Right. <laughs> I know. Um, well, no, I mean, Lisa's absolutely right. First of all, <clears throat> please go to lpac.org if you're watching and donate. Like, donate to help queer women get elected to office. We need more queer women in office. And LPAC does a great job of, you know, getting them in there. Uh, Mary, you ask a really great question. Here's how I try to explain it to people. You know, half of me is this Christian military veteran from Central Texas who, uh, you know, and I, I, I enjoyed some aspects of male privilege for much of my life, right? Yeah. The other part of me is this trans woman who lives in D.C. now with progressive values, and these are part of the same person. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, I do face transphobia. I do face sexism. I do face homophobia. But I'm also white, I'm yep. able-bodied, I'm not a religious minority, I don't have to worry about where, where my health care is coming from. There are all these privileges I hold, and they don't make me a bad person at all, but not recognizing them does make me an asshole, right? If, if you know that you are having an easier time in one aspect of the whole picture, and you deny that, it kind of makes you an asshole. Uh, and so I would ask people not to be intimidated by having these privileges. That's, mm -hmm. There's nothing wrong with that. But there is something wrong with not recognizing the unfair and unnatural advantage they give you over everybody else. Um, we can do better at covering each other's asses. That's what, that's what allyship is, is covering each other's asses. It doesn't matter if it's a Black trans woman who is struggling to find a job in Mississippi or uh, it's a white male cisgender military veteran with PTSD who doesn't know how he's going to get hired because of the uh, stigma surrounding that mental illness. You know, we help each other. That is the whole point of allyship. Someone can be an ally to each other in any way in which they don't have that kind of advantage or privilege. Yeah. And privilege is, is a huge part of it. And I think one of the, one of the um, agendas on the right at the moment is to change the subject so that white people not only don't have to give up anything, but don't have to acknowledge their privilege. And, mm. you know, I think we often, it's often presented the wrong way. Um, white people, white women, Christian people, et cetera, et cetera, 
have privilege not because um, they've done anything. It's just historically been conferred upon them. And mm -hmm. our job, you, ca you can't give it away. No matter what I do, I cannot give that away. Yeah. Um, and can I just say something real here, here real quick to that point, Mary? Sure. And I'm so sorry to interrupt because this yep. is so important. There's something about so many white conservatives who say, well, look at a person who's white and impoverished. Aren't they suffering in a way that privilege doesn't matter? And, you know, and, and here's what would be my response to that. I was raised in trailer parks in Central Texas. I was raised in white poverty. I was raised in those kind of environments where we didn't know where our next meal was coming from. And to act as though my whiteness didn't give me at least a little bit of hope, a little bit of yep. like some kind of, you know, privilege uh, is, is completely fucking bonkers. It makes absolutely yep. no sense. Well, and, you know? and that's been going on since the, the founding of this country that the privilege, uh, sorry, rich uh, white men have used uh, white whiteness to divide white and black working people against each other and they're still doing it you know yeah so mm -hmm. it's a, a really good point and renee the other thing i wanted to get back to that that lisa raised which i had to say really mystifies me and i i honestly i think being a new yorker puts me at a huge disadvantage in terms of being able to understand how people can think certain ways or vote certain ways you know as we saw in uh, Virginia, Young, no, sorry, not Youngkin. Uh, Terry McAuliffe didn't push back against Youngkin's racism about CRT, so Youngkin's racism won. Mm -hmm. um, how how do we try to figure out um, to make our argument as at least as compelling, if not more compelling than the rights arguments to its base. You know, mm -hmm. it's all fear based. It's all it's viciousness, it's misogyny and racism, but they don't have anything to offer other than that. Whereas it seems like we have everything to offer, but it's not working. Well, how do we get that message through? You know, I was watching um, Nicole Wallace today and she had Esper on and as much as, um, you know, yeah. I want to just punch that guy in the face at this point, but you know, listening to him, talk about being in the administration and you know he did say but if i leave someone that's going to come after me is going to be way worse and so i felt like at least it's kind of like what billy jean king always says you got to be in the room even yeah. if you don't want to be in the room even if you think that you're not going to make a difference in the room you got to be in the room the only way for you to make a change is to be in the room and maybe esper felt that way i don't know um, certainly not going to be buying his book. We've seen enough of him on TV over the last couple of days. Yeah. But I think, you know, he's trying to say the core value of this country needs to be the Constitution. And I think that if you can look at it holistically in, in that way, you, you can go back to that. But also the Constitution has changed so much. I mean, look at abortion that we're dealing with right now. Right. Um, and, you know, Kirsten Gillibrand's a very good friend of mine, Senator Gillibrand, and one of the things that I, I remember so specifically her saying to me many, many years ago was, when did we become a country that didn't care? Mm. And I think that's something that we need to really stress is that, you know, Democrats or, you know, there are some very moderate Republicans clearly vote with their pocket, but I think they do care about people. So I think we have to tap into the empathy because clearly everybody's very empathetic right now to ukraine for example we're mm -hmm. getting bipartisan mm -hmm. you know Damn right. everyone's in the senate everyone's in the congress they're all pushing these 50 billion dollars 100 billion dollars they're trying to they have we can find but bipartisanship in that because that's humanity we're watching children die we're not watching buildings being bombed we're watching you know g grandmothers walking across and you know you got Dan about you got like CNN and people taking them across. I mean, there's the humanity of seeing that. I think we need to show the humanity of what who is suffering in this country from mm -hmm. these laws. And we don't show that enough. Go to Mississippi, go to these abortion clinics, go, go and talk to these young women that are 17 years of age that, you know, are pregnant and, and want to get an abortion. Like find out their stories. Yeah. You know, it's like you got to find, it's like the Olympic Games. You know, you all sit there watching the Olympic Games and you hear these great stories of these these athletes that you've never heard of, right? And you yeah. hear these great <laughs> stories of them and then you pull for them. 
and you feel for them and you have empathy for them and you want them to win, but you didn't know them. We need to show that. I think we need to get into the trenches and show what poverty is, ha why it's happening in this country and how can we change it. And all, of course, the racism, the sexism, all of it in this country and start showing and telling those stories. Yeah. That there is nothing more important than narrative, uh, mm -hmm. I, I think, right now, because we're constantly inundated. You know, um, mm -hmm. I, I think a lot of us thought, you know, I don't think any of us thought, oh, Biden won, everything's going to be perfect. But a lot mm -hmm. of us thought, as it turns out naively, <laughs> that things would be better. Mm -hmm. They are so much worse that I... I'm kind of gobsmacked and I feel embarrassed by that because I don't think I should be, but it's, it's again, it's remember when it's like, let's make uh, the oval office boring again. Mm. Um, well, guess what? <laughs> that didn't happen. So Lisa with, with the constant onslaught um, and not just of news, but of news that is immediately negatively impacting the lives of people. Mm -hmm. um, how do how do we help people? Uh, how do we tell those stories to people who are hard to reach, as Renee suggests? And and she's absolutely right. I mean, mm -hmm. that's why I started watching curling because they did like really <laughs> cool. and now I love curling, but I, I didn't know too. who. I didn't know anything about it. So, you know, it is about reaching people who are otherwise. And I want to be clear. I am anybody who voted for Donald twice can go fuck themselves. <laughs> I just think it's a waste of time. It is a waste of time at this point. That is not. That's kind of more of the conversation I want to have. I, I think that's great. Yeah. Yeah. That's I mean, stuff. that is. Well, please swear because this fucking craziness that their mm. narratives always mm. seem to be more powerful than ours, even though not only are ours like more. Um, because life they're angry, of Mary. They're angry. Okay. Right. That, okay. Let's take a step back from that. I actually think it's they're afraid yeah. yeah fear and it comes across as anger i think we need to be righteously enraged at this point and sustain that rage until well probably Agreed. forever <laughs> at least until november so lisa what what do you think about um how how best to uh use our resources because they're not infinite you know we're human yeah. beings and i know and i know our you know our elected officials try to do this. I just don't think they're doing a very good job of it. The voter at the end of the day is your, is your messenger. And, and it's not the politician, you know, go ahead and tell the voter they're wrong. And I'll tell you, you know, another losing campaign. So um, that they, that unlocks the code and the code of that is that is storytelling. And mm -hmm. I think that what Renee was touching upon is absolutely true. And some of the best, ways we've gone. And both my jobs in the administration were in communication. I was chief communication officer at Food and Nutrition, where we were transitioning from food stamps to SNAP and really defining who 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 the hunger audiences is are mm -hmm. in this country and where those benefits go. And mm -hmm. you know, redefining those things. Again, storytelling, putting the cameras in the communities that really show where it's needed and what that minuscule amount is that people actually get for those food benefits. And, and, and yeah. I think that our, the stories need to stop coming from politicians and they need to come from the voters, from the people. And I think that's not that hard. And mm -hmm. if there was time taken with that, I think that we would actually be connecting more and have a, um, a narrative that people could believe in that's hopeful. It doesn't have to be, you know, something like, you know, the world is ending, can even you, though it may can you it game may be. that out a little bit. Like, what does that look like? Well, I think that we've got a couple big message blocks that aren't unpacked yet. I mean, we obviously have June coming next month with the Supreme court decision around choice. And unless we're talking to voter, I mean, to those women in the 26 states or 25 or 28, they're going to lose their complete right. 
like where are those stories where yeah. are those yeah. where yeah. is that voice we yeah. also have the the people who are suffering right now because of the the economic crisis we're in and right. and it is a crisis i mean when you're paying and it's only get worse if you said, if, correct so right. when's the last time we took a camera to a, a you know a pump and said you know here's where we're actually rolling out some benefits for these communities and we're doing block grants to offset some of the higher costs right now you know mm. that's the kind of thing and there's a few other major issues but if it's okay to put the politician or the candidate next to that, but if it's not coming from the voter or the person or the community first, then you've lost the audience. And that's where I believe we should go do more of. And and you also lose the audience by talking about nuance and mm. and uh, David. I spoke with David Rothkopf, uh, and you know it, another variation of the Democrat take X to a gunfight. I said, the Democrats take a 30-page white paper <laughs> to yep, a gunfight. Right. And yep. Charlotte, I think, well, I forgot to tell you guys ahead of time, but I started doing a, um, at the very end of this conversation, I put all of you on the spot. I was going to tell you ahead of time, so I didn't. But everybody has to come up with a bumper sticker. Uh, Ooh, right? That's mm. So you, now you have a little bit of time to think about it. But so Charlotte, um, we part of i think part of what we're dealing with is that democrats are in the minor majority <laughs> that would have almost they're in the minority uh. um <laughs> people you know we people who want everybody to have good health care and a li make a living wage and child care etc are in the majority we it never feels like it mm -hmm. so that can be really demoralizing um especially when we see um, Republicans almost always seeming to get their way, certainly in the Senate, uh, for because the Senate, Senate's not a democratic institution. But in terms of um, messaging, it, it does seem like the Republicans always are better at it. And um, c can you help us find a way to to be angry <laughs> in a way that doesn't scare people off but mm -hmm. kind of breaks through because saying hey guys you know inflation but there are more jobs now uh, okay but that doesn't compare to democrats are pedophiles and going to turn all your children gay mm -hmm. well i mean so let's be clear what lisa just said was was great I, I thought that that was really great advice, and, and I, I hope that at least a couple of lawmakers or their staff are watching this take notes, because that is a really great approach. I also think that it's easy to be angry. We think of people as like shouting and screaming and yelling profanity and all that, and it's not that difficult. You know, honesty is refined anger. Honesty is something that you distill from anger. It is a, it is a a very authentic way of looking at the world. And sometimes mm -hmm. that can be an angry authentic authenticity. And I don't see much honesty right now out of a lot of democratic politicians. Mm. I don't. And I know that's, I, I know that is, um, how do you say it? Problem yeah, say a little bit more about that. Yeah, um, I don't see a an authentic way of recognizing what's going on. I feel like we're all watching this go down and we're terrified mm. and we're saying that we're terrified. Yeah. And then you have some democratic lawmakers who don't seem to understand that fear of what's coming down the pike. You know, I think that there are a lot of democratic lawmakers who are right on, who, who, who agree, uh, who have, the, who have good views on paper, who genuinely have a worldview that is beneficial to the people they serve, but they don't have the guts to articulate that kind of positioning. They don't have the guts to call out what they see, what we're all seeing. Mallory Mamaro was successful because she took that anger and she expressed it in such an eloquent way. She said, no, this is complete bullshit. She didn't say the word bullshit, but she basically said, no, this is bullshit. These, ki these people are children calling out uh, the rest of us as pedophiles for supporting LGBTQ rights. Yeah. That is absurd, it is ridiculous, and you need to be angry that they're doing this. Yeah. yeah. And no one else had been saying that. No yep. Democratic lawmakers had been saying that. Yep. The closest we got was, was President Biden during the State of the Union, specifically citing trans kids. Where is everyone's anger who serves us in elected office? Where is that 
rage that we need to see. And I don't think we see it right now. We, we do see some of it. Dana Nessel, you cannot let that. True. You, yeah. you, the attorney general of Michigan. Mm -hmm. I think, remember, yeah, when she, she kicked off her campaign in 2018 saying, please elect me. I don't have a penis. I, I am a proud lesbian, but yeah, I'm not going to give you any drama and I will defend your. So yeah. anyway, back to messaging and anger. There, there, <laughs> no, 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 you're right. You're right. I got the, I got the bumper sticker. I don't have a wait, wait, hold it, hold it, hold it, because that's at the end. It's a thing. It's a, it's a I don't, segment. I don't don't ruin that. Mary's flow, okay? <laughs> but Mary, I think that was, it was semi a joke, but but that could be. <laughs> okay, so so far, um, messaging. Yeah, so thank you. There but you I'm I'm thinking specifically in terms of the ways in which Republicans co-opt language, mm -hmm. yeah. and. Um, the Democrats, on the other hand, pull punches. So, you know, the infuriating my body, my choice when they were talking about vaccines and masks and not yeah. not wanting to have to do that, uh, referring to the leak of a uh, religious fanatic uh, and misogynist Samuel Alito's uh, draft opinion as an insurrection, if you can believe it, um, you know, but they also co-opt pa patriotism and the flag and all that other stuff. Mm -hmm. And Democrats uh, seem only to use that against themselves. Like Chris Coons accused one of his Democratic colleagues of being too woke. We have 50 Democratic senators voting to protect the privacy of the fucking Supreme Court justices who are mm -hmm. taking away the privacy rights of what will be much more than half of the population. Mm -hmm. So, Renee, what um, how how do we think about this in a way or talk about this rather in a way that helps people understand that um, Democrats just aren't getting it, you know, and the media aren't getting it either. The Republicans are a party of fascists, and that's what we're fighting against. I mean, you know, if you, if you could figure that out, I mean, that's the question, isn't it? Because yeah. unfortunately, you know, if you listen to CNN, MSNBC, you know, the, the problem in this country is that so many people, and I had this conversation yesterday with a friend of mine from who was from Belgium, and we were talking about the abortion rights. And of course, in Australia, it's, you know, abortion is legal up until a certain time, which is the way it should be. Same in Belgium, same in all these other countries in the world. And, you know, we both live here in the United States and I am now an American citizen, um, a dual citizen. And I just can't understand why, you know, we can't express how important it is that, if, that this country is literally going backwards in its protection of women in particular. Um, of course, we have all the other issues with LGBTQ, trans rights. You know, what are they going to do with marriage equality and trans uh, um, rights? I mean, the, the list is long, right? The, I mean, mm -hmm. the governor talking about taking away con contraception. Like, what? We are literally going backwards in this country. And how do we get that story across it? Um, excuse me, we are the beacon. This country is the beacon of democracy in the entire world, the United mm -hmm. States. And yet it is a democracy that is going backwards. And, you know, my very good friend, Liz Broderick, who was the Sex Discrimination Commissioner of Australia, so basically the czar of equality in Australia, she has since left that, left that post, was up for Australian of the Year about three years ago. She sent me a text a few days ago and said, verbatim, Stubbsy, what the fuck is happening in the US with the potential court ruling on Roe v. Wade it's insane. It feels like a war on women. Hope you're well. <laughs> I mean, have a great day. That is the view <laughs> of other countries you're well. that are progressive <laughs> and democracies are looking at the beacon of democracy in the world going, what is going on? I don't, I mean, yeah. I think that needs to be stressed. I think every every one of us needs to get out there. Every politician needs to get out there. And I mean, I love Kirsten Gillibrand the other day. I mean, she lost her shit on the yep. on the podium the other she day. Did. I mean, she is like pounding because she is somebody who has children who probably would have been in that demographic of being a young 
she, I don't know if she's had an abortion or not, but I, I suspect she wouldn't have because if she had, she probably would have said it. Right. But, you know, a young lawyer wanting to make a difference in the world, maybe if she went to college, you know, there's so many people like that. Billie Jean King has talked about her abortion. That's she right. had an abortion at a very young age. And look mm -hmm. at the most amazing things that she's done in her life and career. And she may not have been able to do that if she'd had a child. That is her right. We need to fight. This is not about abortion. None of us sitting in this little box here are okay with abortion. We want choice. That's the thing. And that's the point that we need to stress a lot more. It needs to be about choice, not about, and, and going back in the dark ages. I mean, that's where this yeah. country is heading. It's scary. Well, one of the things that was so terrifying about, uh, religious fanatic Samuel Alito's draft opinion was the cases he referenced. Uh, he compared mm. Roe to Plessy v. Ferguson and mm -hmm. Korematsu, mm -hmm. both of which severely curtailed the rights of Americans. Yeah. Uh, and Roe does the opposite. Um, taking away Roe, on the other hand, I will do similar things to... Um, so... I mean, the only thing I, I slightly disagree, I personally, um, I'm all for abortion in the sense that if it's, if it's necessary, of course, that I mean, I'm, is, I'm talking Mary and like, you know, girls that go out constantly and they're just like using it as a pill. Right. I, yeah. That's but, what I, yeah, no, I think nobody's that's nobody's a, okay with that. But right. who does that? I mean, it's like nobody, <laughs> nobody practically practically this nobody. many people. So yeah. when you're talking about yeah. it, it's right. like, stop making it out. Like, Right. They are like we're pedophiles and we're this mm -hmm. and we're happy with like, I mean, I get people as you would and you, Charlotte, especially writing to me going, oh, so you're OK with like, you know, extracting a baby out of a child. I'm like, what? What are you talking about? But, yeah. you know, Renee, that's that is part of the problem. And Lisa, yes. this is this this is this goes back to not just messaging, but the explanatory power of. Uh, using shock and awe instead of reasoned argument. Um, the only women, and I sh it shouldn't even be called an abortion, quite honestly, but the only women who um, get to their third trimester of pregnancy and have to have the pregnancy terminated are women who wanted those children, but for various medical reasons, it just wasn't, one or both of them would die. It, right. Yeah. So we they, you know, they have their photographs of aborted fetuses, which are, you know, photoshopped. And um, we just have reasoned language. And I think we've seen this, the the trend towards not believing in science, if you're on the right. Um, and are I don't think it's not an inability necessarily, although sometimes it is, but are not being effective enough at pushing back and um, using our own language that's compel compelling and convincing. Because again, what's the difference? We're telling the truth and they're lying. Yeah. Yeah. Right, Lisa? Well, I, and, you know, one of the sick, small successes that have been uh, witnessed late. Well, in just really in the past year on transgender rights of individuals has been on the medical front and pushing back when state legislatures have been trying to deny uh, young people their medical uh, treatment. I'm wondering if we reframe this around this being a medical procedure instead of it being about abortion and about it only about women. This is about men, too. Yeah. I mean, yes. we're not going to get through this without allyship, which is what was brought up earlier. Yeah. It's the same way for our whole LGBTQ community. We wouldn't be where we are today without our partners on all of these issues. And again, men are just as culpable in this situation as women, and they should be joining with us. And I'm not talking about the 25 wackadoodle percent on the right mm -hmm. that are completely unreasonable and never will listen to a damn thing. Yeah. I'm talking about the ones in the middle that will come with us and hopefully be able to push back. But again, it's equal ac accountability here. And this is a medical procedure. And that's why don't we go to why don't we go there? Why don't we try that? I think that's so true. I, I had a two very, very, very good friends of mine, um, lesbian couple. They had a, 
they had to abort their child at five months because the child was was told was going to be either completely brain dead, born dead, or mm. and there was the chance that you know that could affect the mother. And mm. I remember them telling me when they came back to tell me the sex of the baby. That's when they they found out they were going to find out the sex of the baby. And I was so excited to hear it. And they pulled me outside because their other daughter was in the house and they took me out into the garage to tell me what had just been told to them by their OBGYN, who was also a very good friend of theirs. And the, the sheer terror, knowing that that was, that that was their choice was so terrible to them, but yet it was a necessary, it was a necessary thing for them to do. And since have had another child since. Yeah. Mm. And that other child would not have come into the world if they had this other child. Mm. Right. So there are pros and cons to all of this. But the bottom line is they had a horrible choice to make and they made that choice. And it was there was nothing good about it. Mm -hmm. Nothing. Right. And that well, story needs to be told. I, right. The only thing I'd say is the, the one good thing about it is that um, a child wasn't born with horrific life shattering conditions and the mother survived. as you said survived and was able to have another child so you right. know um and charlotte i think that's that's another thing that kind of gets alighted in this whole uh conversation like it, it feels like we're always playing defense like we're pushing back mm -hmm. against their insanity um when right. what we need to do is sort of follow Senator Gillibrand's lead. She talked about condemning a woman to nine months of, mm -hmm. you know, having her life taken over. We don't talk about how dangerous pregnancy is in this country. We don't talk enough about the fact that for women of color, for black women in particular, pregnancy is more dangerous because uh, mm -hmm. the medical profession in this country is deeply racist. Um, and I think it's in Alabama, in Al is it this stat just like black women in Alabama are 75 times more likely to uh, die in childbirth because mm -hmm. medical professionals aren't trained properly. There's, uh, it's not, and it's not just in some cases, unconscious bias, it's historical bias. So, uh, we also need to focus on that, but what happens after that nine months? Yeah. The sure. lives that are changed. I, you said it er, earlier, Renee, uh, about Billie Jean King. The opportunities that are lost. Can we can we kind of shift uh, that in a more forceful way? Do you think instead of instead of pushing back against you know their lies, it, which seems to legitimize them somehow? Well, just call it the fucking hypocrisy. It's ridiculous. They don't care about children. They don't give a fuck about children. They don't. They yep. do not care about kids in this country. And how do we know that? They don't provide neonatal care. They don't provide child care. They don't want to make sure that hunger is eliminated. They don't want to get rid of homelessness. They do not care about That's children. Right. The GOP does not fucking care about children. They don't get pushed pay back against leave. this. Right, paid fa right, pay the family. They don't, they don't support anything <laughs> that would make a child's, a oh, woman's fuck. pregnancy healthier. No. Uh, and safer, or that would make a, a child's life better, or the parents' lives better. So, no, yeah, no. I think that's that's a, uh, an, another good good argument to make. How many children are in foster care? I mean, let's 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 go there. How many mm -hmm. children are in foster care? And if you're in a certain state, you can't even adopt them if you're a gay gay family. That's right. Oh no no no. Oh no that's no. Right. But we need a domestic supply of infants, apparently, according to the but, also you know, psychotic like, <laughs> religious fanatic Amy Cody Barrett. I mean, it's just outrageous. And it's true. Charlotte is right. That's the comment that needs to be say, said. You don't care about children because if they're, right. when they're birthed into the world because they're forced to now, who's going to take care of them? The 16-year-old girl that just got pregnant or her parents? Like, come on. Yeah. And, and Lisa, the other mm. thing that I think gets lost is the fact that their their arguments, and if you read Alito's opinion at your peril, um, the his arguments are purely religious. It just, yeah. This is not this is not on. It's, there's no separation between church and state in this the majority of the Supreme Court, mm -hmm. and by 
you know, it just feels like the Democrats cede too much territory when it comes to religion and guns. Mm -hmm. um, right? Yeah. Yep. yep. And, you know, again, I want don't want to say everything relies on what we just saw in Virginia, but that was the playbook. Yep. And they use religious freedom, parental rights as their pathway of permission to gut everything that we all hold sacred when it comes to reproductive freedom, equality rights, whether it has to do with education freedom. I mean, this is a nightmare waiting to happen after that's why this election cycle i am completely freaked out i mean forget yeah. about 2024 yeah. but this pathway we're on right now if it's the playbook yeah. that i saw unfold in virginia <laughs> i love your cat yes we're done we're yep. cooked because they won yeah. and they're winning and they're shrouding it in ways <laughs> that we're not even able to punch back on because they're like, oh boy, we can't do that because they're saying things that are, you know, I don't know. It's just so ridiculous that we have ceded this ground to them. Yeah. And Charlotte, I, I think that, first of all, I, I don't know if you agree, but I, I do that 2022 is it if we lose and then 2020 will have been our last free and fair election. Um, it's my opinion, but although OAN, they reported today that there was no fraud in the, in the that's lawsuits yeah. can be very motivating. Amazing. Not huh? mine, apparently, but wow. sometimes <laughs> lawsuits can be very motivating. But Charlotte, um, yeah. when we are, talking about this very short time frame we have this seven mm -hmm. month time frame um how do we get because again we don't want to freak people out necessarily, or do we want to freak people out maybe we do want to freak people out um yep. i don't know uh because there is a lot of complacency and it becomes you know the the scandal of the day or the news of the day on the other hand though you know we mm -hmm. have a supreme court justice's wife who's traitor to the country that didn't even right. stay two days in the news cycle, but inflation's on the front page and gas prices on the front page every fucking day. Uh, so can we, um, what do we do to get the attention that we need when again, it feels like the deck is so stacked against us. Uh, the, media don't get it the democratic leadership doesn't seem to get it mm. and here we are screaming into the void but i don't want to feel that way i mean there's always hope right i, I i'm a big believer in hope sometimes insufferably so you know i i like optimism i think it's good to have hope in the future by the way um Y'all's feed is like 10 seconds behind the the audio. I hope, is my audio consistent? Is it good? Am I yeah. all right? Great. Mm -hmm. Great. Awesome. Um, I, I think it goes back to authenticity um, and, and, and talking honestly about what's going on around us. And again, I love so many of these Democrats in Congress because they've done great things in their careers to get to this point. But it seems like a lot of them are afraid to be honest with the American people right now about the situation we're in. And that is going to hurt us because we can see what's going on. You know, everyone who watches the news, everyone who can do independent research, anyone who can recognize that it's completely fucking bonkers that these terrorists attack the U.S. Capitol, <laughs> attack the U.S. Capitol building. And what kind of consequences have we seen for those in Congress who are complicit in that? Yeah, it's ridiculous. It's 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 absolutely fucking insane. It's ridiculous. And we yeah. are not being honest about that. And when we're not honest about it, how can the people who are supposed to vote for us trust us to get shit done? That can is the problem. That's the biggest problem. And we ignore it at our peril. I know you, you can't look inside their heads, but can you speculate or uh, hypothesize about why it is that they, the Democrats are afraid to go where they need to go? I know exactly why. Because Democrats don't have practice fighting fighting, and I know I'm going to say dirty, but, but that doesn't describe it because being right. honest is not fighting dirty. Right. Being honest, just being honest. But they think that being honest is going to make certain voters uncomfortable, certain middle class, uh, middle America, white voters. They think it's going to make them uncomfortable, so-called moderates, and that they'll flock away from us. 
moderates, moderates don't support Democrats, not because of our views, but because we don't have confidence in our own goddamn views. We will not, we, you know, it's like we're apologetic about it. We're apologetic about saying, yeah, in fact, actually it would be good that every single person in this country has unfettered access to free health care. Of course, that's a good thing. We should be saying that. We should be saying that, no, the government should not make private decisions over the private health care of any individual ever, ever. Yeah. doesn't matter what it is. That's yeah. between a person, their family, and their medical provider, period. But we're not saying that. We're apologetic about it. We're like, oh, God, you know, I'm so sorry. I read a couple books about this. And, you know, <laughs> if you're open to it, I would love to sit down for 10 minutes and explain to you why, as a human being, I'm entitled to human rights. That'd be great. Could, could we have Give that kind of conversation? <laughs> fuck that. We should fuck be it. saying, fuck that. No, call it out for what it is. Then Absolutely. people will have confidence that we're going to fight for them. Uh, just a, a quick um, anecdote. I, I interviewed Senator McMorrow, and she told me that, uh, you yeah, know, she went door to door, and several of her consti future constituents she spoke to said, you know, I voted for Donald, um, but I, I'm going to vote for you because just like him, you tell it like it is, Yeah, which makes my head explode. Yeah. But Renee, uh, just taking, taking Charlotte's point a little, yeah. a little further, um, I sometimes feel like that is the problem. People vote for Republicans because they feel like Republicans are fighting for them, which yeah. they're not, but at least they're acting like they are, you know, <laughs> and Democrats are just like, well, yeah. you know, we don't want to upset anybody. Right. Maybe when Democrats are in their little groups, having their little conversations, and I've had several, and as all of you have with Democrats, they drop the F-bomb, they're pissed off, they are infuriated they're they feel marginalized whatever it is yep. they say all of that to us privately but then yep. they get on television and they act very proper and they're oh. they're being political they're being yep. statesmen stateswomen they're being the way politicians really should be in some ways but <laughs> guess what as you know mary donald proved you don't have to be a politician and you don't have to be pc to get ahead in this world in, po in politics no. So straight man talk, straight woman talk. Get out there. If you're pissed off about something, say it. Because that that group, as you said, oh, I voted for Donald because he, he, you know, he tells us the way it is. And I'm so sick and tired of politicians yep. stopping a politician and put it down there on the line. And maybe you got to give AOC credit because she does it. She writes on Twitter. She does this shit. And her constituents and the people that love her love her for that because she's honest. And she says, I was a bartender and I, I can handle a guy like this. I handle a guy like this in a, in a, in a bar fight a, a long time ago. You got to start talking a little bit more that way, you know? Yes. And exposing their hypocrisy because, you know, they complain about elites and then they, you know, diss her because she was a bartender. But they they all have, you know, Foghorn Lakehorn, as I call him, John Kennedy, <laughs> Senator. Yeah. He has Old Jim Jordan, the pedophile. Yeah. He's the one yeah. Right. Well, him a pedophile. Yeah. Yeah. Pedophile neighbor, a guy. groomer. But well, yeah, Foghorn Leghorn has a degree from Oxford, for Christ's sake. So, you know, it's just all a bunch of bullshit. Um, but last thing, and then we'll get, then we're going to get to the bumper stick around. Uh, Lisa, it seems that one of, one, one of the things we're dealing with right now, and we can see this um, because the country didn't stop in its tracks after January 6th, uh, we see this now uh, with the Supreme Court not the leak, although that's not insignificant. The decision is one of the most horrific things I've ever read in my life. Um, our institutions, again, one of the very few things Donald did for us was, was reveal just how fragile our institutions are. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I kind of feel like one way to counter that is to help people reevaluate or evaluate for the first time their relationship to democracy because again we don't really talk in these terms um it's always the republicans waving the flag and talking about patriotism and and whatever mm -hmm. um but so much has been taken for granted that here we are and people and i think part a lot of it is that people do not understand 
what's happened and we need to refocus their attention somehow. Yeah. I mean, we don't have to play, we don't have to swing for the fences. You know, we can play small ball and, you know, pick off seats one at a time. We can also win seats one at a time and protect what we have. You know, there is so much at stake. That's why I mentioned 2024 and looking at the long game. You know, LPAC looks at 2022, but we're also looking at 2024 because we know uh, what is at stake and how this may go is as important as what we're going to do over the next seven months. And um, we don't have to do it all. We just have to do a few things right. And that's all it's going to take. Yeah, we have Congress by a whisker. Yes, we have the presidency by a whisker, but we're going to have to hold on to some governor's seats. We're going to yes. have to we're going to have to hold what we have and then win a few. And we can do that. But we're going to have to win, as I like to say, hearts and minds. And we're going to have to be smart about it. We can't always be everything to everyone. And that's also the other thing that Democrats do. They're like pulling out their yeah. bag of damn tricks instead yeah. of just saying one or two things that they're going to do or they have done and let them, again, the voter be the messenger. They, no if they're not comfortable saying it, let, the, let, the, let, let them tell a story. And that is just as good. Knock on the doors. Take their stories. Absolutely. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Can I add some of this real quick before we keep going? Because yep. I, 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 I think this is such an important distinction to make because what Lisa just said nailed it. <clears throat> and yeah, OK, so first of all, I think that we're still seeing like this, this Bernie Hillary overlay on everything since 2016. Like every intra-party mm -hmm. argument comes down to whether you supported her, uh, Hillary or Bernie. And because of that, every time you, you attack Democrats, there are people who supported Hillary, and I supported Hillary, but there are people who supported Hillary who think that it's it's somehow a leftist thing. And I want to be clear about this. I am not a leftist. I am not DSA. I'm not Bernie Sanders. I am, you know, and those folks do not count me among them. Believe me, they, they are not fond of me. So I want to be clear about this. If you're watching this right now and watch us critique Democrats and you're pissed about that, none of us here are, are arguing for the party to be burned down or some other shit like that. We're just saying that Democrats are sucking at messaging right now. Because they are, because yeah. they are. And we need they to be are. honest about that if we're going to fix this issue. <laughs> yeah, and Charlotte, I'm glad you, you brought that up because I try to remind people that that is the point of the strategy session. Um, first of all, Susan Sarandon can go fuck herself. I just needed to get that in um, because she thinks the Democratic Party is the problem. Um, but we are not talking about policy here. I, I have made it um, um, my goal not to criticize the Democrats on policy unless it's egregious, you know, like the um, immigration thing that Biden didn't end soon enough. But generally speaking, because I think we don't need piling on. The media is doing a good enough job undermining the Biden administration. Um, and, and we're letting I, them get away with it. We're letting them get away with it. Right. And and I just remind myself, okay, how bad would things be if Biden had lost? We wouldn't be having this conversation. I'd probably have to be living in some undisclosed location <laughs> <laughs> without yeah. Wi-Fi. Um, no, this, literally, is, literally. this is about holding the Democrats' feet to the fire when it comes to strategy around winning. <laughs> this is not – I am – I am a liberal progressive Democrat. I have never voted for anybody but a Democrat in my life. I certainly never will again um, vote for anybody who's not a Democrat. This is about helping them understand what is at stake. This mm -hmm. isn't about name calling or blaming. It's just about waking people the fuck up so we don't uh, find ourselves in November living in a... Uh, a closed fascist state, or at least half of the states, you know? Mm. So I'm glad you, you made that distinction because that's, we are not here to say Democrats are bad. They're bad. I'm messaging. still going to vote for Democrats. I'm going to campaign for Democrats. I'm going to donate to Democrats. I'm going to do all those things. But that doesn't mean Democrats are free from criticism when they're clearly being fucking cowardly on the issues. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Have the courage of your convictions. Right. Right. It's it's pretty much that simple. Maybe that's my bumper sticker tonight. But now the so, bumper 
sticker section of our program. Uh, anybody want to start or should I just be mean and pick somebody randomly? R Renee, you said you, you were onto something. No, I said earlier that, that maybe my, uh, my uh, bumper sticker would be vote for me. I don't have a penis. Oh, <laughs> Listen, that works. I mean, in a lot of one, places. That was earlier, but I, I think I, I just keep thinking about um, how the MAGA crowd has stolen the flag. Yes. And I don't know, just something along the lines of give the flag back. Mm. Take you the know? flag back. Take, yeah, but it's just like, that just bothers me so much. It certainly as an Australian living over here for half my life now, just I know how so patriotic Americans are. I mean, it is, you guys just have the, you know, the songs and the anthem before every sporting event, and it's yes. so mm. lovely and over the top and pompous and <laughs> whatever, right? So I know how important that flag is to people of this country, and it is being used in a way that is so bad. It is mm. so bad. And you Renee. saw it going up January 6th. Fuck that. Oh, God. Okay. Yeah, flying an American flag and a Confederate flag and a swastika just, all at the same time. Really it's, American. Um, mm. But, Renee, I'm glad you said that because as, as a liberal Democrat for my entire life, somebody actually called me a patriot recently and the hair on the back of my neck stood up because mm -hmm. the Republicans have, as you said, yeah. taken that away from us. Yeah. And they use, uh, you know, for them, Patriotism is jingoism. Yeah. So I, it's the same thing with people flying flags outside of their houses. Like, you know who's doing that. You know, who, yeah. right? I think, Charlotte, you it, said that earlier. So I, you're right. We need to take that back because it's our country. Yeah. Um, okay. So, Charlotte. Oh, God. I would say elect more lesbians. Seriously. <laughs> elect more lesbians. I love that. There's well, three true. words. Elect more lesbians. That should be <laughs> a bumper sticker. That should be like our, our game set, our, our, our mindset, uh, because we just need more queer women in office. And we don't have nearly enough. And you, you, uh, you know, if y'all are watching this, go to lpac.org, lpac.org, and make a donation. Yeah. Because if you're tired of seeing all of these cisgender straight men fuck things up, Believe me, there's a solution. We're waiting in the wings, ready to lead. If only you would have confidence in making sure uh, uh, that we get queer women in office. So let's let's like more queer women. Absolutely. I, I, let me add one thing. I, I buy all these stupid shirts on Etsy all the time. And one <laughs> shirt that I found in 2020 was Vote Women 2020. And on the bottom it said, because fuck this shit. <laughs> <laughs> Yep. Because fuck this shit. I love that. Fuck this shit. I do yeah. too. Uh, Lisa. Um, I, well, first of all, thank you, Charlotte, for that plug. It's teamlpac.com if you want to, oh, really? you know, oh elect, elect more oh, queer sorry. women to office. And I do think you're right. I elect, elect more lesbians is a great bumper sticker. Yeah. You know, I think about that, that milk commercial, you know, got milk. Got I'm milk. thinking got, got in democracy. Right. And you know damn well That's we don't. So it's like the next word is vote. So yeah. I think it's got democracy question mark vote. So yeah. because people know who read that, we mm -hmm. do not. I I actually I'm in the process of setting up a Shopify store, and I am absolutely all these all these ideas. I'm going. I'm designing a bumper sticker. All proceeds are going to go to organizations designed to elect people. Who Team are Elpac. To Save it, of course. Email back. Um, email back. Dot com. Dot com. Um, and you Laura know, Ricketts is going to love it for that. Thank and you. More, Laura's going to love it. Like the more dramatic, like I, I have two. Uh, one I thought of a few days ago. Um, and uh, oh, you you'll, you'll know where this came from. That's yeah. Awesome. Over educated, over prepared, over it. That's my first one. Ooh. Ooh. And my second one is vote in 2022 while you still can. Mm. <laughs> oh, good one. I love right? that. Vote while you still can. Vote yep. while you still can. Yeah, maybe that, you should just, that is just good. vote while you That's still can. That's damn good. That's what, a good what one. you put in front of it, ladies, vote while you can. Mm. You could put just Have autonomy anything. while you still can. Maybe yeah. just a blank. Maybe I think just that a should, blank. Be, should be God autonomy. No. Yep. 
Oh my goodness. I could talk to you guys forever, but um, I so appreciate you, your voices, your work, your, and I'm going to say it, your patriotism. Um, we need more people like you. Uh, thank you for being, stand together. Absolutely. The flag. Support each other, you know. Um, LPAC is, <laughs> hello. <laughs> <laughs> one of five people who've read that book. I've got um, one over here. <laughs> mm-hmm. All right, this is about LPAC. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I want that flag. Um, seriously, LPAC is an inc- uh, it's so important the work they do and please go to um LPAC. team LPAC. LPAC. com. God. See, What's it's it's wrong? confusing. It's confusing. Team LPAC. com and and find out not just about the candidates they're supporting but the the research they're doing because it's so it's so valuable. It helps educate people, and we need that kind of thing. We need more LGBTQ plus people to represent all of us. Um, so again, uh, Charlie Clymer, Renee Stubbs, Lisa Turner. It is an honor to call you my friends. Uh, I love you guys, and thank you for everything. And stay safe. Thanks, stay y'all. Stay safe, y'all. Fuck that shit. Twenty twenty two. There you go. <laughs> Thank you all for being here and watching this week's episode of the Mary Trump Show Strategy Sessions. Uh, I'm really grateful to my guests, Charlotte Clymer, Renee Stubbs, Lisa Turner. Uh, They have been instrumental in uh, helping increase LGBTQ plus representation. LPAC is an, a great organization. I strongly encourage you to go to teamlpac.com, find out about the candidates we support and the research we're doing, and if you can, donate. Uh, be sure to catch my next weekly strategy session. Um, I'll have a new panel for you. That's Tuesday, 7 p.m. Eastern, 4 p.m. Pacific on YouTube dot com slash politicon and of course uh this thursday and every thursday is the regular mary trump show uh that's youtube.com slash politicon also at 7 p.m eastern 4 p.m pacific and first of all follow politicon on youtube like the episode leave a comment and click this bell because if you do that you will be sure to be notified every time a new episode drops. Also, of course, you can listen to the podcast on Apple Podcasts or wherever you you get your podcasts, and you can send me your questions. Uh, Email me at maryatpoliticon.com. I look forward to hearing from you guys. You can also see the address in the show notes. So thank you again for being here. It is such a pleasure uh, to have all of you and uh, hear hear from you. And I really appreciate your supporting our guests. (sighs) We have our work cut out for us, but we are in it together. So thank you. Stay safe. Be kind. (laughs) 